Hello everybody and welcome back to our Fundamentals of Computer uh, Parallel Programming class. In this unit, we will be discussing the fundamentals of CUDA programming. So far, we have talked about the basics of uh, parallel programming. We covered some hardware overviews of the CPU architecture and then the architecture of the um, graphics processing units, specifically the CUDA um, architecture that is designed and implemented by NVIDIA on their NVIDIA uh, graphics cards. Um, and we covered the compute levels that are supported by CUDA programming and what are the functionalities, basic functionalities. From this unit on, we will focus our shift. We move from the hardware side to the software and the implementation uh, techniques. Uh, specifically in this unit, we will talk about the objectives that we are interested in achieving um, in, uh, in parallel programming and looking at our uh, programming models. Um, and shifting from the serialized model of programming to a parallel programming model. Then uh, we'll talk about performance measures that can be achieved and we should evaluate our pro programs by um, when we compare our, our parallel uh, programs performance measures and performances compared to a serialized model of that program. Then uh, we'll talk about how CUDA implements the parallel algorithms and um, and what are uh, the fundamental aspects that are available to us in using CUDA functionalities. Now I like this quote, quote um, from Dr. John Owens um, who is one of the um, co-instructors of the Udacity's parallel programming course uh, in the Udacity's online courseware and you may have already registered and, uh, and studied a part, parts of these, um, this course and participated in, in, in that course. And a lot of the ideas that, that I will be discussing are going to be very similar and following the path that were discussed in, um, in his um, course in parallel programming. He says, or, or rather he opens up his course by this paradigm, by, by, this, by this question. Or, and, and thought that he had. He said that when he was a child, he wanted to dig a hole to China. Now, it's unfeasible to think about um, digging a hole from one end of the planet to the other end of the planet, but this opens up a very interesting question. And then looking at different views, different approaches to this problem, uh, we, 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 it will it will enable us to think about two different methodologies, two different approaches of solving this, this problem. One uh, which we have reached the limit of and the other which has been uh, actually quite new um, and, 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 and we um, um, may be able to utilize this, this thinking in terms of um, accelerating our performances. So, if you're too slow in terms of digging a very, 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 very long and very, 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 very wide hole, how can we make it faster? There are three different ways that we can actually go about doing. One is to dig faster. Apparently, you can see that we will hit the limit of our capabilities in terms of digging faster. There are so many uh, muscles in, in one's body and everything is basically a physical entity, your muscles, your joints, and so forth. So you, there, is, there is a fundamental theoretical limit um, on how fast you can dig. Another approach is to buy a more productive shovel. That may mean a bigger shovel, uh, a, a shovel with more heads, um, and so forth. And as you see, again, as a physical entity, you will, will easily reach a limit of um, productivity of the shovel that you can make. There's a theoretical limit on the productive on the, on the produ 
productivity of a shovel than one can make and one can buy. Now the third approach um, to, to address this problem of digging faster is to hire more diggers. Now this is an interesting problem um, or, or rather solution to this problem with which poses its own um, little problem uh, in Basically, this is a good idea of the, uh, hiring m more diggers because then once we reach a limit of the pr productivity of the shovel, then we just double the number of shovels. So that, that is a, a, a relatively um, understandable approach to the problem of reaching that limit of how good our shovel can be. Also, it addresses the problem of digging faster because, of course, if one digger reaches their limit of how fast they can dig the hole, if you add another digger to the mix, then you basically double, theoretically, the speed at which they can dig the, the hole. The problem becomes the problem of basically twofold, managing the diggers and also organizing the process. In terms of adding more diggers to the mix, although theoretically you can double up the speed by doubling up the number of diggers, since both of these diggers will end up working on the same problem, on the same hole, you want to um, avoid them interfering with each other's jobs, which is with each other's digging process. But if they don't, then they, bas they basically would not, in effect, double the, the, the speed. Um, although you get a boost in terms of the speed that you, you dig, you won't, you won't reach the... By, by a poor management of your diggers, you won't reach the theoretical limits um, of the speed. Also, you want to be able to organize the process uh, of um, of your your diggers. Now, what did that? What does that, this all mean in terms of processing? Basically, um, digging faster means that you want to increase the processor's clock rate, the processor's speed at which they can operate. This is a very interesting idea. Increasing the clock rate of your processor means that your processor can perform more processing per second, basically reading more data from, from its memory, uh, performing more instructions, uh, floating point operations per second, and so forth. The advantages is that if you basically increase your clock rate of your processor, you are effectively are speeding up the operations, and that is basically all. So you, um, if, you, if you have a CPU that runs at 1 um, gigahertz, and then you just double up the speed, so you have now um, enhanced your CPU to run at 2 gigahertz, that um, effectively is doubling up the speed, the number of op processing operations that it can carry out. There's a problem actually with this approach of increasing the speed of your processing uh, unit, or rather the clock rate of your processing unit. And that is, by increasing the speed, you're making the electronic signals run faster within the silicon chi chips and wafers that this processor is made of. That effectively is increasing the amount of current that goes um, inside of your electronics device and that increases the heat. Basically that increases the power cons consumption of your device and that tra translates into heat which means that then you would have to come up with uh, better heat sink mechanisms uh, probably even needing to put um, uh, nitrogen uh, radiators inside of your, uh, your your chip. So although you can, we can pack a lot more transistors nowadays on the chip, the chip sizes are becoming smaller and smaller, the problem of increasing power consumption and increasing of the heat makes, uh, makes, um, makes it um, imperative for us to create bigger and bigger chips uh, so that you would have more surface area uh, for more heat dissipation and, and, and cooling mechanisms. Buying more productive shovels uh, was the second way that you could speed up your digging process. In terms of processing and electronics and computing, that means increasing the processing capabilities of your processing uh, units. Um, what that translates is that you would have to create a CPU that's capable of uh, processing more complex operations. Um, or maybe alternatively to creating larger word byte lengths that your processor can process. Essentially 
um, that translates into um, the generations of the CPUs that were 32-bit and versus the 64-bit processing units. Um, also, that may mean, in terms of creating your architecture, to create more efficient in instruction set sets. Uh, for example, uh, reduce, um, reduced instruction sets or risk of uh, processors uh, fall under this category. Basically, this still means that you're attempting to go about and performing more processing um, operations per clock cycle. So now, now this the difference between this second way of thinking, making your processor or making your shovels more productive, is actually the other, the opposite of increasing your clock rate. Instead of increasing your clock rate, which makes your um, heat and, and power consumption um, a, a problem, now in this in this approach, we're trying to make our clock work more. So, so, so this idea is basically to pack as many bytes in, a, in, in, in an instruction, or to pack as many instructions um, as we can in um, in our processing cycles. CPUs also hit a limit on the instruction level parallelism, um, and essentially that's this is the limit that we have reached. So our CPUs can, can be as fast as they can be, and uh, we would easily reach a limit of not being able to make more complex operations within um, the cycle of operations that we have, and this is a big uh, uh, um, um, area within the hardware computer architecture research field, um, and that is the complexity of your operations and your control units on a chip um, that are used for decoding of your processing um, uh, of, of the instructions and the data associated with the instructions. So um, that means that um, you, can, you, would, you would easily hit a point that you would run out of um, chip real estate, rather, uh, in terms of design, designing a processor that can operate more complex operations. Finally, the third solution in terms of processing, um, analogous to hiring more diggers, is basically um, creating in, 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 in hiring in, uh, um, more processing units. This is um, the idea that's used in the um, parallel processing on graphics processing units. So the idea here is instead of increasing the clock cycle of our processing unit, or instead of making our processing units fast uh, and, and uh, process more um, operations per second, what we're going to do is that we are going to use multiple processing units to work on our um, problem together to solve the problem. The good news is that by going about implementing a parallel algorithm and utilizing um, a, a highly parallelizable architecture such as a graphics processing unit or a GPU, we essentially use smaller scale simple processors, which means that they are effectively uh, require less power, so there's a, uh, less heat involved with this situation, but we use many of them to work on our process uh, at the same time. The advantages become the fact that uh, using smaller scale simpler processors will become more affordable. And the affordability is not necessarily the affordability of the price wise, but rather the affordability in terms of heat that is going to be disseminated and expended on our electronics device. Um, also, uh, it's the uh, viability of the electronics uh, uh, units themselves. If you, if you go about create much simpler scale processors that are capable of handling very simple um, operations, uh, you would end up with much simpler uh, control uh, mechanisms and much simpler um, uh, circuitry involved with the um, electronics part of your uh, your devices. That means that you could create many more processors per nanometer of real uh, chip real estate than if you were to create much more complex processors or processors that run at much faster clock cycles. The biggest issue in using this approach 
is the management of processors operations again you don't want your processors to keep uh, stepping on each other's toes and interfering with each other's work so this will become the biggest idea and the biggest problem that we try to address with uh, within this class and this is the general um, uh, problem in the parallel pro programming and that is um, the problem of processors management memory and, and data communications, um, sharing, and global accesses, as well as um, synchronization issues. So the big picture here that we are trying to address is parallelism. What does that mean, and what are we trying to attempt to address this problem of parallelism? The idea is to look at your problem that you have at hand and organize it in parallel terms. Try to look at data patterns that, and process patterns that can be parallelized. And try to step away from thinking in serial and look at how you could split this problem. And we talked about four different kinds of um, parallel algorithm, al algorithms or rather patterns that you can, you can, you can view your problem with and, uh, uh, and and try to utilize um, the idea and exploit the, the parallel natures that may be underlying your problem. For some problems it may be easy, for example for loop parallelism, but for some problems it may be very very hard. For example for a um, um, running average problem uh, and sort problems. It may be hard to think about them in parallel, but once you think about them and you find um, um, parallel patterns underneath uh, the overall um, problem, uh, you will be able to exploit and utilize a parallel processing hardware to be able to run your tasks in parallel. When you do that, then uh, you will come with, uh, or, or uh, rather um, uh, analyze your algorithm with two different uh, measurements, step complexity and work complexity. Then you will try to uh, maximize the number of um, units of processing that is done in a specific amount of time as opposed to uh, the amount of time that it takes to finish one unit of processing. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. Modern GPUs are really good in, in helping us and giving us an incredible amount of processing units to utilize. On a modern GPU, you can have actually um, upwards of uh, thousands of arithmetic logic units. Those are the units of processing uh, that can take care of carrying out operations that we are interested in. Um, each um, uh, graphics processing unit may come in hand, uh, with uh, equipped with hundreds of processors. Um, these are um, in the form of simple processors, which then make up uh, our streaming multiprocessors that are the cores uh, of a modern GPU. And they're capable of handling um, tens of thousands of concurrent threads at a time. Now you can see if you can break down your problem and organize it in parallel terms for which you can draw a thread of operation, then you can potentially run tens of thousands of threads of operations on your GPU hardware and this will um, effectively speed up your, uh, your, your, your operation um, and essentially the um, performance measures of the problem you're trying to address. So the goals of this, the, the, the rest of this, this course is to think in parallel when we're given a, a, a pro problem and we, we practice the rest of this class with our programming assignments to start with a serialized problem and we have thought of our problems whenever we were, we were given um, a programming assignments to do we have thought in serial so most of our thinking is, is done serially at this point so what we want to do is we change our look and, and, and try to think in parallel by doing so we will be able to draw threads, draw uh, or, or rather split the execution of our problem into multiple units of operation that can be done at the same time. Then we would like to learn about our um, architecture and we have already done 
uh, a bit of learning of our uh, GPU architecture so far. We'll do a little bit more in terms of looking at how our hardware is um, uh, laid out to help us run our tasks in parallel. And finally, we'll learn how to program our hardware, which is basically writing our projects in CUDA. Before we do that, let's um, take a look at the scales of CPUs. And if you haven't been convinced so far, um, hopefully this will convince you, uh, convince you even further about uh, why we're going parallel. Th this graph that, that comes from the uh, guys from Stanford University, uh, CPU database at Stanford.edu, talks about the scaling technology and how the sizes of uh, CPUs decreased uh, by time. If you look at the 1970s when computers, electronic computers become, became uh, relatively um, uh, mainstream, the size of the uh, CPUs were in the orders of tens of nanometers, micrometers. That's actually a relatively large uh, size for an electronics device. And roughly, um, they kept um, uh, be, uh, doubling in, in uh, or, or rather um, um, splitting in half in, in terms of the size that they occupied on the chip. And so by 2000s, they were in the order, the size um, decreased in the order of uh, 0.1 micrometer. And now, nowadays, in, in the um, second decade of the 21st century, we're looking at nanometer technology. I remember when I was going to college, actually, in, in, the, in, the, in the mid 90s, the, the nanotechnology was, was essentially still, still uh, a, a sci fi uh, topic, a futuristic topic. But, but nowadays, we are actually in the nanotechnology time. Similarly, we can look at our um, clock frequency, our clock cycle. Again, the graph from the Stanford University that shows the speed of the clock cycle on the processing units. And again, if you look at the um, Intel CPUs back in the 90s, uh, the clock cycle was uh, less than 1 megahertz. In the 80s, your processing units were running at about 10 megahertz. Uh, that's 10,000 um, clock cycles per second. And they slowly picked up. And nowadays, in around the two, two, uh, 2010, the clock speeds are roughly above uh, 1 gigahertz. That is 1 million clock cycles per second. So if you go on the Stanford website, uh, you can basically move your mouse over uh, each of the producers or manufacturers of um, electronics um, central processing units, and it will show and highlight um, all their processors, and you can see the speeds that the processors actually run. So nowadays we're at about, you know, we, we, we can easily hit the um, 5 gigahertz per second of the clock speed. But as you see, the speed actually has literally flattened out in, over the last decade or so. Uh, we saw this, the speeds of 5 gigahertz uh, back in 2000, um, 2001 and 2, and the clock cycles have, have stayed almost constant since then. So comparing your um, exponential clock speed before even I entered college and then relatively a linear clock speed in the late 90s uh, until the 2000s and then a constant clock cycle nowadays that we have reached. So this graph convinces us about the speed um, limit that we have reached. And unless the technology changes and we go to a different area of computing, we will not, we will not foresee any kind of drastic speed change that we have seen in the early ages of computing, basically from the 70s to the 90s, that the speed of our processing units uh, would uh, exponentially expand. And this is the area that, that we see that we uh, justifies the need for parallel processing and parallel computation. We cannot increase our speeds, so let's increase the number of units that we can run at the same time. So what happened? Why 
did we end up with not being able to increase our, our clock cycle? The problem, as I said, is heat, is, is the power consumption. When you increase the speed of your um, electronics, you're effectively increasing the amount of power um, that's consumed on the, elect uh, on, on the electronics device per capita, which means that essentially it's the, the current of the electricity um, that's involved with your electronics and the physics um, of the electronics involved with, which produces a lot of heat. Um, so the, the, the faster your device, the more heat it consumes, the larger um, and, and more advanced heat dissipation technologies you need, and so that basically uh, drags down on how fast you can make your device go. As a consequence of this problem, researchers have looked at an alternative um, way of developing, and that is when the CPU technologies from single core CPUs have shifted to multiple core CPUs, and, you know, dual core 4, 8, 16, and so forth. So build smaller processors, but rather make more of them, so that you would be able to run more um, units of operation um, in the same amount of time, um, which is basically the idea of uh, processing speed. So in terms of processor design, there are two paradigms, and we already brushed upon these two paradigms, and what, what are the similarities and differences between the two. Essentially, in the central processing unit design and architecture, you want to create complex control hardware. What that means is that you want to create more flexibility, and you want to be able to handle more complex operations uh, uh, at the same time. And, and that, we, if, if you look at the Flynn's taxonomy, that, tran that translates for, um, to the, the four different paradigms, the, the four different um, architectures, single instruction, single data, single instruction, multiple data, multiple instruction, single data, and multiple instruction, multiple data. As you see, the more complex, the, the most complex one of these four architectures, multiple instruction, multiple data, and that requires a complex control hardware. This still has the problem of large power consumption because that more complexity means more flexibility, means more uh, complex um, electronics architecture, means larger power consumption. And that is another problem that we encounter, uh, let alone the complexity of the, the, the software design uh, perspective of it. Alternatively, we can go about looking at the design of graphics processing units. Graphics processing units take a different approach, a uh, rather uh, dramatically different approach than central processing unit design. The idea with designing graphics processing units is to create smaller and simpler control hardware um, architecture, essentially creating devices that are capable of running simpler operations, but being so good and, and, um, and efficient at, at running those simple operations that once you put them together, you will be able to accomplish um, a larger scale of a problem. This design, of course, becomes less flexible, and uh, you, you, you essentially would end up with much more specialized operations that you can do, so they wouldn't really be a general purpose um, computing unit as a CPU would be. Because with a CPU, you would essentially have an instruction set, and you would basically be able to run any kind of operation out of that instruction set. With a graphics processing unit, you actually have a specialized processing operation. And there are certain kinds of operations that you can uh, specialize at and run at, at efficiently. But uh, in terms of a general purpose operation, they become quite inefficient. However, CUDA is promising to change that paradigm and making the general purpose, purpose programming because of this new architecture uh, much more flexible and available on graphics processing units. Also, consequently, because we have much, much smaller, simpler pro control hardware architecture, we can have a larger number of processing units embedded within our hardware so that we can run um, them together with the same amount of data, with the same amount of power consumption and that we would be subject to.